In this video, I'll demonstrate the phenomena of entrainment, explore the concepts of sinks and saddles, and show the effect of perturbations on a system of two coupled driven pendulums. Entrainment occurs when two or more oscillators link up to form a phase-locked relationship with one another. When you have two identical pendulums, only two modes are possible, the in-phase mode and the anti-phase mode. Let's take a look. Now we're going to look at in-phase synchronization, or what I call the first deep sync. I'm starting the system here with the board set low and dropping the pendulums from the out-of-phase position, or anti-phase. However, it's obvious pretty quickly as you watch them that they're not happy there. If you look at them as they share their energy back and forth, just like any two coupled pendulums will do, you'll see. Let's fade for a while and then come back after they've settled down. As you can see, they're perfectly happy in the in-phase mode. Now let's look at the other deep sync, the anti-phase mode. This time I've raised the board and I'm starting the pendulums in the in-phase position. As you can see, once again, they don't particularly like that. They're tending towards the anti-phase mode even from the beginning. Now they're taking a little longer to settle in. Christian Huygens had to wait a half an hour for his pendulums to get in sync, once again in the anti-phase mode, but we can do it much faster now. Let's fade out for a while and then come back. Sure enough, when we come back, the system is perfectly happy in the anti-phase mode. So these are the two normal modes you see with two pendulums. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between the way the system acts in the deep sinks and at the boundary state. Now deep sinks have some wonderful qualities. They're very stable, just like a well-built motor. They run the same way every time you turn them on. The starting position of the pendulums doesn't matter either. It doesn't affect the mode that it settles into at all. And perturbations only cause a temporary disruption. You could spin them around like an airplane propeller, it wouldn't matter. But the boundary state is an entirely different matter. Here a whole new set of properties emerge. In the boundary state you're no longer in a deep sink. Now you're on top of a saddle and just like a real saddle you can fall off. When this occurs at the boundary state the starting position, the starting energy, and the effect of perturbations matter a great deal. Now you can't see it in my video, but I'm using a potentiometer to lower the energy a bit, and it's the only way to actually get to that boundary state. When you start the pendulums in or out of phase, they actually stay in the phase they were started in. This is an example of hysteresis, or the system settling down based on both its current and past environment. And now, perturbations no longer lead to sure predictable modes. Instead, they lead to a variety of outcomes with differing degrees of probability. Let's take a look at how this all plays out. Remember that now we're at the boundary state, halfway between the deep sinks of the in-phase and the anti-phase modes. Let's start out by dropping the pendulums from the anti-phase position. As you can see, they start by falling into a nice anti-phase mode very stably. Let's fade out for about 15 seconds or so and then come back and take a look. When we come back, we see that the pendulums continue to oscillate nicely in the anti-phase mode. So what happens if we stop them and then start them again in the in-phase mode? Remember that when we were in deep sinks, the position of the pendulums when we dropped them didn't matter at all. Let's take a look. We're going to fade out in a little while and then uh, come on back in 30 seconds or so and see what happens. As you can see, the pendulums are also happy in the in-phase mode. So now we know that the parameters of the system are set so hysteresis can occur. In the previous slide, I also mentioned different response to perturbations. So what happens if we perturb the system? 
In this case, we're going to do so simply by adding excess energy, like so. Now we're going to fade out for about a minute and a half. It takes a little while for the system to settle down. Then we're going to come back and take a look. Well, this is interesting. Now the pendulums appear to have settled into the anti-phase mode. So maybe with a parameter set like this, the anti-phase mode is the most stable one, even to perturbations. If this were the case, the system would fall back into the anti-phase mode every time we perturb it. Let's do it again and find out. Okay, we're going to fade out for about a minute and a half, and then we'll see what happens. Well, another interesting finding. This time the pendulum on the left has died while the one on the right continues to beat. The pendulum on the left has experienced what we call beat death. Interesting. Let's perturb the system once again and see if there's any pattern we can discern. This time we'll fade out for about two minutes or so and then come on back. Well, this time the pendulum on the right has died, and the one on the left is continuing to beat. I did this experiment 25 times, and four times it settled in antiphase, seven times beat death on the right, seven times beat death on the left, five times beat death on the left and right, and one time in phase. Obviously, the outcomes are now in the realm of probability. So what does this tell us, really, and, and why is it important in, in a more general sense? what we see with two pendulums. Well, it tells us that the way a nonlinear system settles down can be complex, and that's an important thing to remember just at the outset. It also shows that depending on the parameter settings, certain and probabilistic outcomes may be intermixed. It reminds us that at the boundary state, appearances can be deceiving. For instance, the modal motion may appear stable, but it can respond to perturbations in an unpredictable manner. So if the system is drifting while you're at the boundary and your goal is to keep it stable, follow these steps. Number one, make sure the overall forcing energy is low and then stop the system. Then start the system in the desired modal position and let it settle down. Don't add too much energy. If perturbations are hard to avoid or disrupt, you can either repeat these steps or adjust the parameters. Okay, so much for physics. Let's have some fun. Let's generalize beyond two pendulums on a board. One advantage of understanding the general properties of these systems is that they scale nicely. And what I mean by that is they apply to larger systems of linked oscillators as well, like those of the human brain, for instance. Say we're teaching students who have trouble focusing. Let's use these principles as a metaphor for this scenario. Assume our teaching goal is to help the students stay focused, but they tend to drift. They're at the boundary state, you might say. We're going to talk now about what the teacher does, but first we have to admit that a hidden parameter here is the student's distractibility. All right, let's substitute one term for another. Let's call forcing energy the external demand placed on the students. And we'll call perturbations in excessive demand or internal distractibility, causing them to drift. We're going to stop the system, stop the drifting and loss of focus caused by the perturbations. And we're going to start it back in the proper modal position. We're going to get them refocused again on the task, doing it properly. We're not going to overdrive the system. We're going to keep the demands within an acceptable range. Now, it's not just accidental that nonlinear dynamics fits so nicely as a metaphor here. In fact, it provides a conceptual scaffolding for many things we see around us in everyday life. And as importantly as anything else, it provides a vitally needed counter to our bias towards linear thinking and simplistic cause-and-effect relationships.